Sicily is notoriously difficult to reign. Littered with mountains and hills, the movement of armies was exhausting work, supply lines were always tenuous, and the abundance of strong defensive positions meant that it was hard for an attacker to force a defender to battle on equal terrain. When combined with the fact that Sicily is an island, which brings obvious requirements, this meant that having a strong navy would be key to winning the war and solidifying control over the island. In this way, the First Punic War is unique among antique conflicts, in that it was waged mostly at sea, with the largest naval battle in history being fought in 256 BC. This left the Romans in an interesting position. Never before had they stood on non-Italian soil, and they had paltry experience in naval affairs. Up until now, they had to rely on their allies for naval strength, but this would not be tenable when faced with the fantastically large Carthaginian navy. So there could only be one cause of action. The Romans first commissioned a fleet in around 260 BC, with the aims of challenging Carthaginian dominion of the waves. So, how did classical navies work? In the centuries leading up to the First Punic War, the most common type of ship was the trireme. It got its name, literally a three-rower, from its design because it had a rowing group of three, with each man sitting on a different level and operating a 14-foot oar. Modern reconstructions show that this ship could reach eight knots with oars alone, and could chug along steadily at four knots. With the sails down, they could reach a speed of eight knots. They were able to perform a full turn within two ships' length. The dawn of the 4th century BC brought advancements in ship technology such as quadrireme's 4 and quinquireme's 5. There are even tales of huge leviathan ships constructed in Ptolemaic Egypt with 40 or 50 rowers, though these were never combat ready. Quinquireme's were not called such because they had five banks of oars. Such a setup would be massively impractical and anything more was beyond the realms of possibility. Instead it is likely that quinquireme's had five rowers spread across three oars. This makes more sense when you consider that trireme means three rower, not three banked. The lowest layer likely had one rower, while the upper two had two pairs of men. Polybius tells us that the Romans copied the design from a captured Carthaginian ship, and we don't have much reason to doubt him on this. For normal occasions, ships had around 40 marines aboard, while 30 men were required to row. Naval combat was conducted mostly through ramming or boarding, Missile fire was generally not a feasible method of inflicting da any damage upon the ship or its crew, contrary to what some historical strategy games would have you believe. With ships so powerful, the rams were blunt enough to ensure that the ship would not get lodged inside enemy ships. The other option was to board ships, which is a pretty self-explanatory affair and didn't require much skill from a crew. The crews for these ships were large and had a relatively small food stores, and meant that they couldn't spend much time at sea, making secure supply bases incredibly important for the naval strength of the nations. One final piece of technology used by the Romans was the corvus, a boarding bridge with a spike at the end. It was capable of rotating across the front of the ship and dropping onto the enemy deck, allowing the Romans to flood across and make use of their superior hand-to-hand -hand fighting prowess. But with this overview done, I think it's time we get back to the events. One of the consuls for 260, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, was put in command of the fleet, while his colleague, Caius Duilius, was the commander on land. Scipio sailed ahead of the fleet with 17 ships to Messana, preparing for his full force to arrive once it had finished its construction. It was in Messana that he received an offer for the betrayal of Lepara, the largest in a string of strategic islands north of Sicily. Eager to deny Carthage the significant holding, which he controlled access to Italy, he accepted this offer and rushed to the island. He, he arrived and occupied the harbour, but Carthage would not take this line down. The Punic fleet was stationed in Panormus, and its commander, the same Hannibal who had, gar who had commanded the garrison at Agrigentum, sent a detachment of 20 ships to drive off the Romans. They arrived and locked the Romans in the harbour, who were soon defeated. Scipio earned the cognomen Asina, Latin for donkey or ass, for this debacle. The Romans made up for this victory by defeating Hannibal in a small naval battle off the dramatically named Cape of Italy. The first major battle happened in 260, when Duilius received news on the Carthaginian position at Mile. Moving quickly, he raised anchor and set off. The Carthaginians likely had 130 ships, while the Romans, counting the ships lost at Lepara, had only 103. Hannibal sold a mighty hectareme captured by from Pyrrhus a decade earlier. The stage was now set for the first major battle of the war. Thirty Carthaginian ships, Hannibal's among them, powered forward and engaged the Romans, but the Corvus proved its worth and soon they were being boarded. Hannibal's ship itself was boarded and he lost heart, fleeing in a small boat. The remaining ships yet to get bogged down manoeuvred and flanked the Romans, hoping to avoid the Corvus altogether, but the Romans were, were miraculously able to counter this threat. 
Seeing the battle unravelling in favour of Rome, the Carthaginians skilfully disengaged and, recru and retreated to safety. The Romans had done it. In one of their first major naval outings, they performed magnificently, mostly due to their ingenious corvus. Somewhere from 30 to 50 Punic ships were lost during the battle. The next encounter occurred near Tyndarus, and, like many sea battles, occurred by accident. In 257, a Carthaginian fleet sailed past the fleet of Caius Regulus, and he boisterously sailed forth with ten ships to engage them, while most of his fleet tailed behind him. He paid the price for his boldness, as none of the ten ships were sunk. Fortunately, the tide was turned when the remainder of his fleet arrived, and the Carthaginians, using their superior skill as sailors, decided to withdraw to Lepara, and that was the end of that. With characteristic boldness, the Romans began upon a new course of action and decided to bring the war to the gates of Carthage. They would invade Africa itself. To this end, they assembled 330 ships and took the huge fleet down the coast of Italy and around Sicily, picking up the land army. According to Polybius, this gives a total Roman force of sailors and marines as 140,000 men. The Carthaginians, on the other hand, had put together 350 ships, with a manpower total of 150,000. If these numbers provided by Polybius are correct, which they probably are, give or take some exaggeration of which all ancient authors are guilty, then the following battle would not just be the largest naval battle of the First Punic War, but the largest naval battle of all time. The fleets moved towards each other across the Sicilian coast, with both Roman consuls being present, showing the importance they placed in the upcoming clash. The Battle of Cape Ignomus began in 256. The Romans divided their force into four groups, and the first two were arranged into a wedge, while the third formed the base of this triangle, and the fourth group was arrayed behind this triangle and acted as a reserve force capable of fending off and reacting to Punic manoeuvres. After seeing the Roman deployment, the Carthaginians organised themselves into a hook with their left flank facing Sicily being angled forwards. Hamilcar, the chief commander in Sicily, commanded the centre of the Punic lines and ordered his ships to pull back in the face of Roman attack, with the aim of breaking the Roman formation and giving the other ships the chance to flank the Romans and avoid their corvi. The Romans took the initiative as usual, and the two first groups moved forward to engage the enemy. In response, Hamilcar's divisions pulled back while Hanno's wing moved to engage the Romans' fourth, and their right wing moved to engage the Romans' third. Hamilcar had split up the Romans, but it didn't do him much good. After a struggle, his ships were defeated and driven from the battle. Marcus Regulus then wheeled around with, many ship with as many ships as he could get and attacked Hanno's division, which was menacing the Romans' fourth. Together they defeated Hanno's squadrons too. The final flame of the battle occurred near the shore, where the Punic left had driven back the Romans' third all the way to the shore, but they were, but they were reluctant to engage the enemy any further as the Romans' corvi were all lined up. Eventually, Manius Vulso brought some ships to their aid, and the Carthaginians, seeing no hope of victory, fled. Once again the Romans had triumphed over the Carthaginians, showing their increasing skill at naval combat and warfare, and also because such huge, clumsy quantities of ships naturally catered towards boarding actions. After stopping to rest their tired crews, the Romans set sail for Africa and arrived at Cape Bon, more specifically the city of Aspis. They quickly besieged and captured the city before raiding into the rich and fertile African countryside, taking over 20,000 slaves and putting many farms to the torch. The Senate ordered one of the consuls to come back to Italy. Volso took the main fleet and, while Regulus was left in Africa with the land forces and a small squadron of ships, it should be noted that this was Marcus Attilius Regulus, who had been commanding the recent Battle of Egnomus, not Caius Attilius Regulus, who was his brother and fought the Carthaginians at Tyndarus. Regulus had around 15,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. He had so few cavalry because it was difficult to transport them over ship. In a desperate attempt to, pr to protect their jugular, Carthage elected two new generals and recalled Hamilcar from Sicily, who brought 5,000 infantry and 500 cavalry with him. In total, the forces of Carthage outnumbered the Romans, but not by much. The three generals held joint command. Regulus marched in late 256 and besieged the town of Addis. In response, the Carthaginians moved in and occupied a hill overlooking the Romans. Regulus immediately decided upon a course of attack, seeing that the broken terrain of the hill made the Carthaginian advantage in elephants and cavalry less effective. The two-pronged attack began at dawn. After initial successes, the Carthaginians pushed back the Romans' first column, but after a pursuit they were attacked by more Roman troops and destroyed. The cavalry elephants and remaining troops fled the battle upon seeing the defeat of the main contingent. Regulus's gamble had paid off stunningly, and now nothing stood between him and Carthage. He quickly took Addis after the battle. 
Grimm doesn't do the Carthaginian outlook much, just, much justice. Their mighty navy had been torn to shreds at Ignomus, and now their army in the field was destroyed. Regulus was at the gates, and the wars with the Numidians flared up again. So they tried their hardest to sue for peace, but Regulus, in the traditional Roman negotiating style, offered terms which were so harsh that the Carthaginians decided to continue the fight. The terms offered by Regulus were actually harsher than those offered 14 years later at the war's end. In the winter of 255, Carthage began building a new army, and in this process they drafted a number of men from Greece. Among these was a Spartan named Xanthippus, an experienced mercenary. He criticised the Carthaginian commanders for deploying on a hill where their elephants and cavalry were ineffective, and was eventually appointed as some sort of military advisor to the Carthaginian commanders, and drilled the army in proper military manoeuvres and discipline. Their new army was composed of 12,000 infantry, 4,000 cavalry and 100 elephants, and was a mishmash of various forces from Sicily, Africa and Greece. Eager to inflict another crushing defeat and end the war, Regulus, despite his surprise at the energetic Carthaginian response, did not shy from battle and encamped 10 miles from the Carthaginian camp on a plain. The next day, the Carthaginians deployed for battle in a formation devised by Xanthippus, with the citizen phalanx in the centre, mercenaries on the right, and cavalry split between two wings, with mercenary skirmishers supporting them. Finally, a line of elephants was drawn up in front of the infantry. Opposite them, the Romans were drawn up into the triplex aches, but their lines were made deeper with the aim of preventing the men at the front from retreating from the elephants until the beasts could be driven off with missiles. Their pathetic 500 cavalry was stationed on the flanks. After a short delay, the battle began. Xanthippus ordered the elephants to charge forwards, and the Punic cavalry engaged their Roman counterparts who were easily defeated. Despite causing many deaths, the elephants failed to rout the tightly packed Romans, and they pushed their way past. Some success was achieved on the Roman left, where allied troops charged against and routed the mercenaries before chasing them back to their camp. The remaining Romans trudged on rearily, but by the time they engaged the Carthaginian phalanx, the Punic cavalry had returned and attacked their flanks. Soon they were crushed. Regulus and 500 men fled but were quickly captured. Only the 2,000 who had chased the mercenaries away escaped the defeat at Tunis. Carthage had scraped through the jaws of defeat and come out with a few scratches, but they were alive and kicking. They had regained some of their former stature, defeating the Numidian princes and, secure, and seeing success in Sicily. Carthaginian fortunes returned, and the war continued, as it would for another decade. The survivors holed up in Aspis were eventually relieved by a fleet of 350 vessels strong, which defeated the 200 Carthaginian ships sent against them, capturing roughly 100 of these vessels, and then they picked up the Aspis garrison and left for Sicily. Instead of returning to safer waters, and against the advice of their captains, they instead cruised along the Carthaginian held south of Sicily, intending to use ore to convince Sicilies to join their cause. But while they were doing this, a huge storm wrecked their fleet. Polybius recounts that 80 of the 350 ships survived, but he neglects to mention that the Romans had captured 100, so the exact figure eludes us. It is with the destruction of the Roman fleet that we will end this episode, for it is already 13 minutes long, and I really need to get some sleep. <laughs>